All right, well, first of all, how did we first become interested in healthcare fraud? Well, as you were really the key instigator of this whole project because you sent the uh, New York Times four-part series on Medicaid fraud. And I found myself, I remember coming, we were, I was coming back from uh, Iowa, and I was in the Des Moines airport, and the flight was delayed, so I had an extra hour to sit there. I was reading, and I'd read each article in amazement and then go to the next one. By the time you finished the four-part series, uh, it was obvious that the level of fraud was so amazing. Um, the New York Times estimated that of the $44 billion that they had in Medicaid in New York State alone, uh, over 10 percent, four billion, four hundred million dollars a year, was pure fraud. And they had a couple of great stories. One about a dentist who'd filed 982 uh, procedures a day. Uh, another about a dental office in Brooklyn that had somebody who stood out front and basically said, "If you will loan us your Medicaid card for 30 seconds, we'll give you a free DVD player." And you looked at this stuff and you just thought, "I mean." How can people think they can get away with it? But because it was a paper-based system, they could. And then from there, uh, with your leadership, we developed an entire conference at the National Press Club on fraud. And the people you had come speak about it were so astonishing. I mean, you couldn't, you couldn't quite believe the stories. Uh, and finally, Alan Levine, when he had been active uh, in Florida before he went to work for Bobby Jindal in Louisiana, had helped a federal state task force on fraud. And on one particular day, they closed 17 HIV AIDS <coughs> transfusion centers in Dade and Broward counties. Five of the 17 centers were pizza parlors that had simply filled out the paperwork and become federal HIV AIDS transfusion centers. Didn't do, I mean, did nothing except take the money. So out of all that, um, I concluded, uh, really based on your leadership, that. Uh, fraud is a major component of our health bill and that uh, we had to have a focus on understanding how to get at fraud in health care if we were ever going to have an affordable system. Why do you think that Congress hasn't talked about this issue very much? I mean it could very well be hundreds of billions of dollars a year across the system and for whatever reason it's just not a particular major topic in the ongoing debate. What struck me as a former member of the Congress was that, and this is why I think the book you've done on fraud is so important, nobody had taken all these ideas and pulled them together, one, to win the argument that, that the fraud is that big, and then two, to show, as you do in the book, practical, realistic steps that could be done. And I think uh, this book is going to be uh, a revolutionary impact on the public debate about how we run Medicaid and Medicare and how we run the health system in the future. And certainly our hope is that if it gets the traction that we think it could get, that volumes two and three will just write themselves and this will be an ongoing project. The last question is who should read this book? Well, I think any citizen who cares about the future of the health system ought to read it. I think that uh, every member of Congress and their staffs ought to read it. I think every state legislator ought to read it. And I think any civic leader who wants to understand why a paper-based public bureaucracy is incapable of policing billions of dollars in the modern age uh, should read this to realize how big the change has to be for us to get to an affordable, honest system. Can you describe the kind of expertise you were able to a track to write for the book? Sure, and what was particularly nice about the whole experience is all the authors spent lots of hours putting their chapters together and didn't get compensated in any way. So people just had very, very good stories to tell. And they're experts from the healthcare field, experts from the credit card field, experts from uh, health in, or information technology with, especially the credit card industry is a great analogy because it's about the same size as the healthcare industry, about two, two and a half trillion dollars. 700 million cards in circulation, you know, millions of vendors, infinite number of products, and their, as you say, are their their fraud rate is far below one percent. We're in healthcare, ten is a conservative number. Yeah. Uh, is there any other part of the country other than New York and, and South Florida that you think has a particularly rich uh, fraud background? Well, the larger the city, there tends to be a lot more uh, fraudulent activity. 
So you have New York and Chicago and Los Angeles and others. New Orleans has a long history, although it's cleaning itself up pretty quickly. Um, but having the Medicare and Medicaid claims data available for public use is a huge step in the right direction because not only does it tell you where the dollars are going, where the fraud is, but it also shows health outcomes. So you can find out, for example, like the Dartmouth Health Atlas does, uh, they can tell you what facilities are more likely to produce better outcomes. And that's extremely helpful for this debate. I want to say that Stop Paying the Crooks, the new book of solutions to end the fraud that threatens your health care. Uh, done by uh, Jim Frog and an entire team of folks working with the Center for Health Transformation, I think is going to be a revolutionary book. And I would urge everybody who wants to know where's the easiest place to get money to pay for health reform, take a look at Stop Paying the Crooks from the Center for Health Transformation with Jim Frog as the editor. And I think you'll find that if we just stopped paying the crooks, we'd save an amazing amount of money.